ओम भूरघुस्वितुर्वरेण्यम भर्गो देव सदीमहि धियो यो न प्रचोदया ओम शांति 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 नमस्ते डियर फ्रेंड्स टुडे आई विल टॉक अबाउट द सेल्फ रियलाइजेशन एंड इट्स मेथड्स आई विल स्टार्ट फ्रॉम कंसंट्रेशन मेडिटेशन एंड कंटेम्पलेशन सो फर्स्ट आई विल टॉक अबाउट कंसंट्रेशन concentration is the doing of puja that is the act of worship to a particular god in the prescribed manner and the performance of the various karma kanda rituals in concentration god is represented by a symbol idol or picture and worship is done by various movements of the physic here the mind is drawn out in the various physical oral and mental motions that one has invariably to make in such acts of worship thus god is symbolized and is conditioned by the action or motions of the body mana and buddhi all the rituals prescribed under the karma kanda come under this head this is the most ordinary type of sadhana or spiritual practice even in puja there is still a better type here you go to the puja room sit before the idol or figure and instead of engaging yourself in various activities just look at the idol or figure the movements of the hands feet and mouth have no place here all actions are stopped and puja is just confined to the act of looking but here too the infinite sarveshwara is symbolized he is taken to be external to the devotee here brahma is made concrete and the mind is still drawn out as mental vibrations or virtis so this is only better than the former among the pujas the best type is not to look at any picture or make any type of movements or do act uh, at all but it is to imagine the form of god it must be purely a mental act but here also god is action actualized or represented by a symbol that symbol is imagined within the mind when you close your eyes and try to fix in the mind the form of god here it is concentration within and by the mind most of the external actions are dropped off there and the mind imagines alone though this is the best type of worship even here god is conceived as being conditioned brahma is taken to have a rupa a form and as such this is not the real and right sadhana now i will talk about meditation the next level in sadhana is to step into dhyana here one leaves the form but takes to inam nama the form is given up but a particular sound is caught by the mind one concentrates now on the sound or dhvani of a particular mantra so adi sankracharya has told a person having the divine light in his heart and meditating with full devotion will eventually achieve enlightenment this achievement in itself is the salvation and attainment of vishnu loka that is the abode of lord vishnu it is said that the following practices in succession are subtler and subtler 
starting with the rupa it goes to sound then to light then to the origin of the mind and finally to the dissolution of dissolution of the mind this is an important principle in adhyatam sadhana the shorter the mantra the better it is all of the mantra japas come under the sound or dhavani meditation mantras are many in number and are of many varieties if you go through tantra shastra it gives thousands of mantra gayatri is a very wonderful vedic mantra among all these mantra if you take the shorter ones those will be better do not take to repetition of long mantras among all the mantras the shortest and the best mantra is om a u m om or parnava two methods of mantra japa in the repetition of the mantra there are two methods followed to repeat or mutter it by the movements of the lips making it audible is the lower mat ma method the higher method of japa is not to repeat the mantra and audible by all you will have to chant it silently mentally without even opening your lips or moving your tongue so the shortest mantra and the silent mental repetition of it form a higher class meditation or japa but even this is not the highest type of sadhana even silent repetition of omkara parnava cannot compare with gyan nist nistha om is symbol of brahma what are the reasons for saying so even in such mental chanting one does not have the right concept as to what the brahma is here the brahma is brought down to the level of omkara om itself is taken to be the brahma which is the symbolized or thought to be symbolized in this mantra actually one should think of the mantra and then direct the mind to the state of brahma above the level of mantra we shall know this better through an example you are walking in the street there is a sign post at a crossing showing the direction to particular town you never mistake the post to be the town itself it only indicates where the town is so instead of hugging the sign post you must walk in the direction pointed out by it similarly you have to know and study the omkara as a help to know more about the atma then you must just transcend the omkara and go to the state of the atma as indicated by it mistaking the symbol as brahma when you do jap puja you take the idol to be the god that is not correct by keeping it as a representation of god you just send the mind up and try to remember the all pervasive brahma beyond time and space we make the mistake of thinking that the transcendental brahma that sarveshwara beyond all limitations such as time space etc has come down as the idol that attitude of taking the pratika itself as brahma sarveshwara is wrong similarly to think that om itself is par brahma parmatmanam and that nothing else need to be known is absolutely wrong many theoretical vedantins and even many sanyasis are caught up in such a delusion and for years they spend their time in the repetition of om never attaining jnana they are just fooled or deluded as they stick to the sound of the mantra without sending the mind to the truth indicated by it but om kara when repeated silently in the mind becomes the highest dhyana and this can be converted into nidhi dhyasana that is contemplation by better vedanti understanding of the meaning and purport of om what does om mean contemplation 
let us now analyze the meaning of om it represents the three states of our experience jagrat swapna and susupti we recognize the external world only in one of these three states mind acts only in and through these states the world is there as long as the mind is there mind is there as long as these three states are there the individual or the world means in a sense just these three states so om represents these three states that characterize the jiva it is known by all students of vedanta that atman is beyond these three states and the antakarana and the inner equipment so om not only represents jagrat swapna and susupti but also it indicates the basic principle pure consciousness atman upon which these three states come and go just as waves are formed on the surface of the ocean waves are nothing but the ocean in a sense waves rise up stay and subside in the ocean the ocean is never affected by the presence or absence of waves it remains ever the same but waves cannot exist without the ocean such is the relation between the three states waves and the atma <clears throat> the meaning and purpose of om now as the basis of jagrat swapna and susupti as the basis of all our experiences inner or outer there is the pure consciousness that is atma how to locate it is the problem that must be indeed the first effort of the sadhaka we have to go to the substratum of this universe that is of the mind for this our ancestors first searched the outer world but could not get at the substratum when they turned within and retreated into the inner chambers of their consciousness they found the substratum atman for teaching others the technique of introversion or retreating within they discovered this beautiful mantra om now let us study the content and the idea of om any experience in the universe anything that is seen or felt can be communicated through phonetic sounds our rishis analyzed the science of phonetics take for example when sanskrit letters are spoken the sounds come from the throat originate at the tip of the tongue and are produced by the lips all sorts of possible combinations are represented in the sanskrit alphabet in the arrangement of the letters all these sounds can be contained within the range of these three sounds a the one having the origin in the throat u that which is from the middle of the mouth and m that which is produced by the lips these three actually represent the range of all phonetic sounds and languages these also represent the beginning middle and end of all phonetic sound now our rishis united these sounds together as om and produced the mantra which is otherwise named parnama thus om represents the entire range of verbal sounds again om represents the three states of consciousness jagrat swapna and susupti as observed already the ocean is not just the waves alone it is something more than and beyond the waves similarly atman is not just the three sounds or states but something more and beyond this fact is indicated by the ati mantra da elongation elongation of the sound of om the humming sound at the opening opening and closing of the lips the ati mantra represents the pure consciousness or turiya so you must have this correct understanding of the meaning and purport of om with this knowledge when you sit down and mentally chant om 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 you have to feel that three states of consciousness jagrat swapna 
एंड सुसुप्ति मर्ज इन द प्योर कॉन्सियसनेस एज द थ्री पार्ट्स ऑफ द पर्णवा मर्ज इन द अति मंत्रा दिस मर्जर इज नॉट टू बी इमेजिन बट एक्चुअलाइज कल्टिवेटिंग दिस भावा एवरी टाइम यू चांट ओम द प्रोसेस बिकम्स कंटेम्पलेशन और निधि ध्यासना एंड द माइंड गोज बैक टू इट सोर्स दैट इज द प्योर कॉन्सियसनेस और आत्मन दिस इज नाइदर कंसेंट्रेशन और मेडिटेशन दिस भावा कन्वर्ट्स द ओमकारा ध्याना इन टू वेदांतिंग कंटेम्पलेशन Without such a bhava, if the emphasis is merely on the sound aspect, it is just meditation and not contemplation. Such is the real technique of Vedanta sadhana. Many sannyasins for years carry on meditation on Om, but since they do not, as an upasana or sound meditation, they never come near jnana sadhana. so do not emphasize the sound aspect cultivate the bhava and then feel om thus go through the sound to the bhava and thanks to the pure consciousness and sink the mind there this is nidhid dhyasana as the three syllables merge in the ati matra let the three states of consciousness the thoughts merge and dissolve in the silence and let the atman unfold there there is still better technique discovered by the rishis to know this technique you have first to know the nature and function of the ego now <clears throat> how to trace the ego and know its functions let us trace the ego sit down and mentally chant om and simultaneously generate the bhava that the pure consciousness represented by the ati matra is the substratum on which the three states of the consciousness come and go but at the at that time your mind will stay away in the form of other vrittis that develop in the mana buddhi or chitta these multifarious vrittis come and go following each other in quick succession but behind them there is a relative witness remaining unchanged as long as the vrittis last and that is the ego or aham vritti see when our eyes identify with the body so this thought or vrtti what we call is known as ego mind and ego both are originated from our soul our atma for mind and ego the source is our soul so this we have to remember i and the mind the false i or i identifying with the body give rise to the mind the continuous flow of thoughts from the atma constitute our mind mind is not an independent entity mind is completely mind depends upon completely on the atma because mind originates from the atma this we have to remember the universe or anything objected to us is known only through the sense organs see our atma is just a witness all our day to day functions thinking talking everything is done with the help of ego and our mind the sense sensations or impressions are gathered by the mana mana means mind and the mana is nothing but a collection of thoughts notions or ideas vrittis now all these thoughts come upon that innate i in other words these have the ego as the substratum so our ego hmm? our ego is 
doing all the functions in our daily life. So the I, ego become the universe. See, continuity of thoughts arising from the soul constitute mind and I-ness identifying with the body constitute ego. Everything that we experience object in the world or subjective in the mind is the expression of the I. Only in Susupti the I remains dormant. If in a dream you fly in an aeroplane, that plane is the creation of your own mind. In short, it is the expression of the projection of the I. The deluding expression of the ego. Now this Ahankara or I also comes from the pure consciousness as a ripple, just as the waves come upon the surface of the ocean. The ego ripple remains stable and non-changing, serving as the background for the other thought ripples to come and go. The I thought is the first thought. Rest all the thoughts come after I thoughts. So, I thought is the original thought. This ego again has a very curious and wonderful capacity. When it sprouts up from the pure consciousness as a ripple, it has the power to cloud the substratum itself. See, ego originates from the soul. And this ego try to cover up the soul. This feature of the ego is called avarna, like a veil, veiling. It veils the atma. It covers the atma. The capacity to veil mask the substratum. It has also the power to present or express itself as something apart from the pure consciousness. See here, pure consciousness, self, all these words, they are used for our soul, Atma. This feature or power is known as Vikshipa. That is a deterrent, a sort of hindrance on account of vikshepa, we recognize the outer expression of the ego and are not able to see the substratum, atma. Atma is the substratum. When the waves are formed on the ocean, they have the capacity to veil the ocean itself. Many children look at the waves, not at the ocean. They take the form of the waves as the reality and forget to see that which is the substratum of the waves. So do the ego and its progeny cloud the Atma. The subtle Buddhi can find it. This unique fact of our consciousness should be very careful, observed and understood. Who can understand this? The ego itself can understand this through the Subtle buddhi is not buddhi an expression of the ego. Ego analyzes things and arrives at conventions with the help of buddhi. Our buddhi has two functions as it were, one which analyzes the facts and problems of the external nature and the other the subtle one which ponders subjectively and discovers the hidden facts of our consciousness. Vertigina is essential for contemplation. Vertigyan. Understand clearly that the three states of consciousness, that is Jagrat, Swapana and Susupti. Jagrat means awakening, Swapana means dream, Susupti means deep sleep, are not at all the absolute reality. The supreme entity we serve as their substratum is the Atma, the pure consciousness. This is the source of all virtis. Virtis means thoughts, ideas. Thoughts ripples, the primary virti coming upon it being the ego. 
This primary virti means I thought. You must have this virti jnana, knowledge of the nature of the virtis, before you sit and contemplate. Only then can you maintain the bhava. Remember the fact that Atma, pure consciousness and I are one or I am the Atma. How to keep this bhava continuously during contemplation? For this our rishis have invented some glorious mantra. Very short but very deep in meaning. One such is Soham. By this mantra, see, we breathe in and breathe out. So these are the two sounds. So, hum. By this mantra, we mean that infinite consciousness is in me as the ahem, virti, I-ness. I, the individual, have the all-pervading reality, sat chit ananda as my true being. The pure consciousness is I. Here the individual ought to remember and affirm I am the Atma, the pure consciousness. Probing or tracing out the root of the I. So among all types of sadhana, the best is to trace out the origin of I and remember it constantly. Here I means I thought. Where from it is? Originating, it is originating from our Atma, from our soul. So we have to divert our I thought or mind or ego inwardly. That is the meaning. Theoretically, we know I has its root in the Atma. But how exactly to realize it? This is the problem. More, see, I thought will always try to go outward. It, it will go outward. Now to realize the self, we have to divert inwardly. This is the problem. Moreover, before taking up this contemplation, a doubt may arise in us. If the Atma or pure consciousness remains unknown to us, there is no use in repeating Soham. What is the use of repeating sa? He, when sa cannot be known. Again, if the Atman is known principle, there is no need to repeat the mantra. When I am quite conscious that I am a man, there is no need to repeat manushyam. I am man as it is. Atma is not already known to us. And if Atma always remains unknown, what is the use of just repeating Soham? Locating Atma, it is realized only by the mind merging in it. Its existence is grasped by the subtle Buddhi. See, we cannot know our soul with the help of mind. Mind has to be destroyed to know the Atma. Atma can be known only by Atma or pure Buddhi. Well, here is the answer to such doubting questions. To say that Atman is either known or that it is unknown is wrong. It is neither known nor unknown. It remains always within us as the very basis of our existence, experience and knowledge. It may not be known through the senses as an external object that is experienced by us. It is beyond the realm of the senses but can be grasped by the subtle buddhi, the sharp penetrating intellect. So we can locate it vaguely within ourselves and then directly jump on it or merge with it. Withdrawal to the inner chambers of consciousness is the method. The next question is how to locate the Atma, the Sakshi. So far as our experience shows, life consists of just three states of consciousness, Jagrat, Swapna and Susupti. In Susupti there is no sense experience. The ego remains quite latent. In Swapna we have the knowledge of the subjective experiences 
and these are nothing but the projection of the mind. In Jagrat, we have the knowledge of the external world. Objective to us, this knowledge is had through the senses. Our sages first analyze the external world, made an objective search outside themselves for knowing the ultimate reality. When they failed, they sat down, kept quiet, and conducted the inquiry within. They retreated into the inner recesses of their own consciousness. It was then only that they were able to locate the Sakshi. Sakshi means witness. The witness who sees all the transformations that take, takes place through Jagrat, Swapna and Susupti and also serves as the background and source of all the Vartis. Now, how to demonstrate to a sadhaka that there is a Sakshi within who witnesses all these and remains changeless? I have told you already how we can locate the Sakshi in my last talk. I shall repeat, it becomes, it is very subtle and important matter. The, deli the delicate process of comprehension, the antahakarna, the inner conscious mechanism consists of mind, intellect, chitta and ahankara. Chitta that is subconscious mind and ahankara, our ego. In Swapna and Susupti we cannot do any sadhana. So let us confine our attention to Jagrat only. During our wakeful experiences, various thoughts or virtis are rising up in the antahakarna. These virtis rise up on the mana, buddhi or chitta. Thus, there are three types of virtis. The sense organs gather the impressions of the objective world and these are taken up by the mana in the form of various ideas and notions. Without the mana, the Senses cannot function and mana cannot work only with the help of these sense organs. Mana can be roughly compared to a sensitive camera that gets the impression or image in the sensitive plate through the lens. Indriyas collect impressions and the mana keeps them within as ideas and notions or rather we can define the mana to be just a collection of ideas and thoughts, sankalpas, mana, then hands over all these ideas and notions to the buddhi. Buddhi summarily rejects most of them and shifts, analyzes, relates, correlates, and thus churns knowledge or wisdom out these umpteen notions. Just a very fractional part, a minute part of the ideas alone is kept or retained as knowledge by the buddhi. You are reading a book. The eyes read every word. The mana gathers all impressions as ideas. But after closing the book, you can retain only a fraction of the ideas you had while reading. Similarly, by listening to a talk, you can get a lot of ideas expressed, but you gather and keep only a handful of them. This selection and rejection is done by the buddhi. Functions of the mana and the buddhi. Now there is a very important point. Where the antakarna is functioning at a particular instant, either the manavirti or buddhi virti is produced. While reading a book, you come across a point that kindles your inquiry. You then start thinking, what does the author state? Is he correct or you are listening to my talk? Here too, Antakarna is full of manovirtis to start with. But when I pass a particular remark, you just start thinking, what does this, is he correct? That reflection, this analysis is done by the buddhi. When you are thus reflecting all what I speak, then will not make any impression on the mind. When buddhi virti fills the antakarna, mano virti does not exist there. 
the moment buddhi starts functioning manovirti stops so at a particular moment only one function take place in the mind thus we find that buddhi is that part of the antakarana which takes the necessary ideas or notions from the mana and the and works upon them and converts them into knowledge intelligence is a feature of the buddhi buddhi decides it also orders the mana functions of the chitta the next subtle aspect of our antakarana there are people who are very intelligent who will learn anything in an easy manner but they have no memory as quick as they learn they forget too their buddhi is quite well developed but the chitta has no proper development chitta is the forgetting and remembering part of the antakarana contemplation by chitta now contemplation must be done by chitta the most subtle part of the antakarana in bharat varsha alone the technique of nididhyasana or contemplation by the chitta was discovered and perfected our rishis perfected the technique of contemplation so well that along with the spiritual advancement of the sadaka he could also have the development of his intelligence and genius as by products these are just acquired on the way people blossomed into glorious and highly wi- highly wise personalities when they took to this technique of contemplation i have given you the examples of kali dasa valmiki and panini who originally were of very mediocre intellect but became versatile genial personalities after doing tapas they attained atam gyana and along with it their minds became genial and versatile in a marvelous way remember the sakshi by the chitta nidhi dhyasana is the contemplation done by the chitta the function of the chitta is to forget and remember when you repeat or mentally chant soham and om you should remember the sakshi soham means the all pervading consciousness is within me or he is i the meaning of the mantra should not be repeated in any other language when you mentally say so hum but you must be able to consciously remember the sakshi the witness that is all when you sit and meditate if the mantra japa becomes mechanical understand that meditation is done by the mana when you have some stress or strain in the mind and you want to get up from the seat and go away or when you find it difficult to sit even for a short period understand that the repetition is done by the buddhi when you do not feel like getting up and meditation is very happy peaceful and effortless understand that the repetition is then done by the chitta so serene and calm will be your mind then you will have a peace and joy then this is contemplation the process of remembering this sakshi now we shall talk about how to remember this sakshi in contemplation before remembering it you must know previously what the sakshi is you must therefore first locate it i shall explain how to do that you are sitting down and contemplating so hum so hum silently and continuously you chant the mantra initially it is done in a calm and peaceful manner at the innermost part of your consciousness then suddenly it may come up as buddhi virti and a bit of stress will be felt by you during the japa as we already antakarana can have only one type of virti at a time when the buddhi virti fills it the chitta virti slips off then again slowly you continue your repetition without your knowledge many other thoughts and notions will come up then the mano virti would have set in at that time and the mind would start straying 
just as bubbles are projecting and subsiding in water so also in very quick succession these thoughts will be rising up in the antahkarana so much so that it will no longer be so hum but office ahem house ahem market ahem so you will be just spending some time thus when all these thoughts and ideas will be passing through your mind then suddenly a very curious thing occurs some conscious factor within flashes up from somewhere and just witnesses the straying of the mind this discovery this awareness takes place for a very short time maybe for a split fraction of a second it suddenly becomes aware of the straying of the mind from the repetition of so hum discovering the self or the sakshi now be very attentive antahkarana is full of thoughts in other words the mind is composed of thoughts the mind moves not being fixed to a single thought there is a sudden awareness that the mind has gone from one thought to another this discovery this awareness cannot be within the mind antahkarana that which discovers the straying of the mind cannot be the mind itself that we see the thought and its straying cannot be another thought so the principle which witnesses the straying of the mind is really something beyond the mind beyond antahkarana this is our atma the sakshi chaitanya within this is the self pure consciousness the discovery of the string of the mind is by the atma such is the method by which we can very correctly locate this sakshi the self the self is aware of itself then as the self is pure luminous so prati parsava in evolution self withdrawal once you have this particular experience of locating the atma in other words experiencing the expression of atma you should start remembering that pure consciousness the pure awareness that witness the straying of your mind that which expressed itself when the mind was wandering you must try to remember that very principle or entity by the chitta go within and try to sink in that awareness in such a retreat turning within you will find that the mind automatically dies it goes back to its source then sinks and dissolves there this vedantic contemplation is therefore to drive the mana buddhi etc to their source or origin as long as you do japa or concentrate so long as you keep your vision in objectivity mana and buddhi will act in an extraverted manner they will have only the outward movement it is only the chitta which can have this backward movement its function is not to reach out or project forth but reflect backward and go within this is very aptly termed as prati parsva which means in evolution going back to the source so mind and ego they are directed to go to the source that is our atma the spiritual heart it is subjective retreat within an inward search this alone will take us direct to the sakshi sakshi witness that is atma all the other methods will pull the mind out or project it into the realm of objective perception nature of the chitta this is how to contemplate by the chitta chitta has the capacity to remember and forget it stores up things in memory and whenever you want any particular fact or knowledge it will bring the same back to the forefront of the consciousness something known to the mind will be taken over by the buddhi and will be later passed on to the chitta for storage it has many pigeon hole for storing the accumulated knowledge this storage in the chitta is called apohana now how can a person remember a 
particular thing that is forgotten, draw it out as it were from the depths of the chitta. The technique of remembering and forgetting. The technique of remembering and forgetting is very clearly explained by our rishis. Let us take an example. You are listening to a sloka. I repeat it. You understand it and get it by heart. Now it is stored up in the chitta. Next morning you get up, do your routine things and suddenly you want to recollect the sloka read out by me the previous day. You start thinking, struggling to bring it back to your mind. You are not able to. What is that? What is that? Such a deep inquiry takes place within you. Your eyes close, your limbs become motionless. All external activities and sensations stop. The mana and the buddhi also stop their function. You are just carried out in the current by the force of deep inquiry. You know it there in the back chambers of your consciousness. It is not immediately tangible or objective to you. That is all. When you carry on such an inquiry, a, a stage comes when for a fleeting second you forget the world, body, mind, etc. You are in the shunya state, zero state that is, thoughtlessness, as it were. When you forget yourself thus, then most curiously the sloka that you wanted to re recapture flashes before you from somewhere. Has this not been the experience of all of us? Suddenly from somewhere the forgotten sloka flashes for so the process of forgetting yourself consciously is the process of remembering a forgotten thing. It may sound to be a paradox but it is a fact. Precisely when you try to remember a thing intently you forget everything and when you thus forget everything Consciously, you catch back in a flash the forgotten thing. Self-inquiry, remembering Atma. Atma is always there and we have somehow forgotten it. We have now to consciously try to remember the Atma through the Chitta. Buddhi and Mana cannot do it. The Atma cannot be perceived or known by them. Take to the process of contemplation by Chitta and do it intensely. When you are absorbed thus in a very deep and serious inquiry, suddenly the mind will stop, all thoughts will cease and the Atma will just unfold, reveal itself. This is the supreme sadhana, the Vedantic Nidhi Dhyasana. All of other processes will take the mind out in concentration or meditation. The mind comes out, it symbolizes the Atma outside of objectively or inside in the form of imaginations. You are imprisoned in the realm of Nama and Rupa, outer or inner, but the Vedantic process of Nidhi Dhyasana is beyond Nama and Rupa. It is done at the level of Sakshi, the highest principle in the human personality. Now when you actually sit and contemplate and try to remember the Sakshi or without your knowledge of the thoughts will rush in. Do not fear the straying of the mind in contemplation. Do not be discouraged. As Krishna says in Gita, where the mind strays away, you must bring the mind back and keep it steady on the Atma. So, do not relax your effort. The human mind has such a vast accumulation of past tendencies that it won't easily take to this type of contemplation. It will be terribly reluctant to contemplate, but never allow it to dominate you. In the initial stages, you must have serious, sincere steady and intense sadhana. Never allow the mind to control you. Man and Buddha should obey you always. Ask Chitta to contemplate and never slacken your efforts till you reach a stage where contemplation is effortless, free and peaceful. You must never relax your effort. It is. It certainly takes some time to perfect this technique you will find peace and joy in the practice gradually. So, steady, serious, sincere 
sadhana is indispensable for progress on the spiritual path. Nididhasana is subtle, not difficult. Hence, take to this glorious method of Vedanta Nididhasana. Do not think I hate pujas, idols, etc. Not at all. But these practices are at the lowest rung of spiritual sadhana. When a better, nobler, easier course is offered, take to it directly. Don't think you have to go through every stage step by step immediately. Accept the highest technique. Come on and take to it wholeheartedly. It is subtle and not all difficult. Being subtle, you have to grasp it by attentive hearing and silent reflection. The lower practices will give only impermanent results. Again, all the benefits that will accrue to one from the lower spiritual practices are categorically classified by the disease to be impermanent and in reality worthless. The attainment that one has in Jnana Sadhana is Paripurna. It is Satchit Ananda and Brahma Jnana that has no comparison in this world or hereafter. So never think of God and start praying of things in this world or hereafter. Never be a beggar, never have the attitude of supplication. If you pray to God, oh God, please give me jnana, he would if at all say, my dear Bhakta, why are you praying to me? I have already given you the chitta, use it, sit and contemplate. You will easily have jnana. Now there, there is a slok in Bhagavad Gita. It says, I am seated in the heart of every human being. From me alone rem remembrance, knowledge and forgetfulness spring forth. From all the wisdom there is only one myself as the pure consciousness. To be known the maker and knower of the Vedas, I am the Atma. Vasana Akshay necessary for Atma Jnana. The subtle tendencies must be destroyed for self-knowledge. Now while you carry on practicing this, you will advance bit by bit in sadhana. Your mind will cease to be turbulent. It won't rush out during contemplation. You will enjoy the inner peace and poise resulting from the cessation of thoughts. But a stage will come when all the thoughts will completely stop and you will be in a state of sunne or jada samadhi, progressing no further. That is in a state of sunne or jada samadhi, progressing no further. That shows that vasanas aksya has not been complete in you. Contemplation is only one aspect in Jnana and Nishta and the other is Vasana Aksya. It means destruction of propensities. That is subtle impressions. Dharma, Prem and Tyaga. You should base your Life on dharma, ethics, discipline and self-control. Again, you must cultivate tyaga buddhi, sacrificial attitude and try to develop pure love and compassion towards all beings. This is the best method of ridding yourself of the vasanas. In short, be pure, ethical, self-sacrificing and compassionate. Vasanas will then surely fall away with this two-pronged effort you must carry on. Contemplation should go hand in hand with purity, love and sacrifice. Just as two blocks together pull a cart, so these two nididhyasana and vasanaksya should guide your spiritual life. Samadhi Anubhava Experience of Samadhi that is the state of super consciousness. When your mind is absolutely pure, when all the vasanas are exhausted, one day you will have a very wonderful unfoldment of the Atma. It will be such a unique experience that you can never miss it or mistake it. 
what that samadhi experience is like it cannot be expressed in words nobody has explained it it is just wonderful that is all nothing more can be said about it you will then have a feeling of absolute fulfillment you will be complete in all respects requiring nothing apart from that experience this is the samadhi anubhava peace joy and prem will be bubbling up in your being tattvam asi as a such it is the origin of the whole universe the universe is its expression the mahavakya tattvam as he teaches that basic i in us which is the bedrock of all the thoughts and objective perception is one with the atma the sakshi so take a firm decision to do very serious systematic sincere steady and steadfast sadhana wake up early in the morning don't sleep sit here and keep quiet and contemplate is there any other method that is easier and nicer no if you depend upon the man and buddhi alone they will certainly betray you resort to the chitta and do the contemplation as explained by this contemplation the whole personality is purified and strengthened the buddhi becomes sharp and the mana bright after the contemplation enter your daily life do all your jobs well your work will now be more refined polished you will start working executing and not struggling work will be no more impure and irksome as you will find divinity everywhere ladies do not waste your time in gossip in forenoons and afternoons especially after 10 am your husbands would then have left for their work and children would have been sent to the schools from 10 to 12 noon is a wonderful period for you for contemplation when you will be feeling slightly hungry that is just the time to sit and contemplate never load your stomach any time best of all time for practice is the early morning contemplate for 1 hour and you will notice that your body gets as much rest and composure as when you would have slept for 3 hours take to this glorious path and attain atmagyana and live like the ancient rishis rishi kumaras and rishi kumaris om shanti 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 hi thank you dear friends please subscribe my channel like share and comment the video thank you thank you dear thank you